Praise the Lord. Good morning. Glad to be on this morning. This is uh, the 29th day of March. We're almost at the end of March. Let's see if we can adjust this. Good morning. I'm Pastor Sam Colon, and as you can see, I'm here at the church office instead of at home. I uh, have a few meetings on this side, this today, and it's always a pleasure to be here anyway. Um, God bless each and every one of you. We welcome you to our Tuesday morning devotions on this, the 29th day of the month of March. And uh, we had some tough news this past week on Friday, Friday late afternoon, early evening. Our beloved and sweet sister Mildred Espinosa uh, received her promotion, so she was blessed. But we are left grieving the loss of one of those special people that uh, became part of this virtual family here and the morning devotions. And actually throughout any, any uh, live service and also a member of the 21st Century Institute for the, rather, the, the, the Institute, uh, the Bible Institute for 21st Century Ministries. I, I went about it backwards. And so on behalf of all of you who are part of our family, whether you're a circle of Christ or um, uh, our sister Liz is from Assembly of God Church, uh, Van Ness, um, the new song folks that come on, and our friends from uh, Florida and California and uh, New Jersey who come on from different churches and different venues. Um, you got to hear us intercede on a regular basis for Mildred Espinosa. She survived by two daughters, one Yvonne and another one Jasmine. I I've met Jasmine. Um, and Jasmine has two daughters, one 14-year-old and one 8-year-old. Uh, We're going to be missing Grandma immensely because they lived with her. Uh, and so we are, uh, yeah, let's just uh, let you know who she is because you prayed for her and many times she came on and uh, she she would uh, testify victory. She would testify victory. Um, I never heard, I never read any complaint on the comments. Just so grateful that we would constantly remember her in our prayers. And you know, as a matter of fact, uh, something curious that came to mind and I announced it in our church is that we, we were praying for her to live and to beat the cancer. She had a very, very severe cancer uh, that had spread. And, um, and she went through uh, a, a protocol of chemotherapy that was very strong and, um, and effective. And we celebrated right here on this, uh, on this channel, on Circle of Christ Media channel, her victory, she rang the bell, which is a tradition and part of the protocol of completing your chemotherapy and checking to see if there were any remnants. And uh, she was what you would call in remission. And she did not pass from cancer. Unfortunately, um, just about a month and a half ago, she was stricken with COVID. And COVID is a beast. And um, it's just so sad that she would have gone through so much in the um, protocol for chemotherapy to experience the victory and the joy and then to be smitten with the COVID and, um, and the COVID damage to her lungs so severely that um, there was a point there on Friday where we just released it to the Lord. And one of the pastors from Promised Land Church, um, 
uh, one, one of the ministers there, uh, I think her name is Lisa, Lisa Mycinette. She might go by a nickname. Um, but uh, she prayed uh, for her as Mildred transitioned. And uh, soon after the prayer, the Lord had already um, taken her to his repose and to paradise. And so we, um, we are uh, grieving, but at the same time, we celebrate her life. And so for those of you who are interested, and we would love to see you there, her funeral, um, the wake and the homegoing service is all together on this Thursday. This Thursday at the Thomas Montera Funeral Home. That's on Westchester Avenue. I think it's 1868. I'm doing that from the top of my head. Westchester Avenue, but it's it's right there. There's several funeral homes around there. I think there's Puerto Coeli, either north or south of it. And uh, not too far from the old Joe's uh, restaurant, great restaurant, and not too far from Willie's Steakhouse. Uh, yeah, that, that's how I know what things are at by restaurants. <laughs> Anyway, um, and so I think she'll be exposed um, there at the at the um, funeral home from like one thirty on, and uh, I, I hope to be around getting there around five thirty six o'clock, and we'll start the service uh, as soon as I can get there, and we'll start the service around six thirty six fifteen six thirty. Um, just to give people who are working time to get there. And the service will be about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, we have folks from the Church of Revelation, where she was a longtime member and a very, very important member in ministry there. And there will be members of, uh, and I believe Pastor Mike Carrion, the bishop and overseer of Promised Land, uh, Promised Land Covenant Church, where she was a member of right until her dying day. And, and of course, we, who, you know, who adopted her, and she became part of our virtual church, found out last night that she did visit us, and I prayed for her, and I spoke into her life, and uh, someone who brought her up for prayer let me know. And, you know, I... I uh, it was early on, and I was just getting to know who she was, and I don't have a good recollection of it, but the person who brought her up, Maribel, says, oh, yes, Pastor, you spoke to her and everything, and you, you got to pray for her and lay hands on her. And, and that was, uh, that was uh, early in the, in the uh, pandemic situation. So we, we thank the Lord for the ability to... Uh, celebrate her life and so again once again this thursday this thursday at thomas montera funeral home and the service will be around six o'clock the doors and her body will be at um, for viewing in the wake uh, uh, from 1 one thirty on and uh, her daughter jasmine will be there and uh, I believe her oldest daughter, Yvonne, will be there also, and, um, and other family members. So uh, thank you all. Yeah, Jason Mitchell Weber always helps me out. He says it's 1948. I had it as 18. <laughs> so, but, you, you know, most people can find it just as Westchester Avenue <laughs> underneath the L underneath the L. So thank you, Mitch, for always helping me out. Um, and so we say good morning. We say good morning to Ronnie. God bless you, Ronnie. Always an early bird. We miss you, Ronnie. And Titi Doris, she's with us, one of the mothers of the church. God bless you. Many blessings to you. Muchas bendiciones para ti, Titi Dori. And uh, let's see. Um, Jillian Rawson, oh, we had a great time. With new song, um, uh, gosh, I know his name is Pastor Mike, uh, uh, and his wife Donna Lee, 
they did an outstanding job. Wow. And we, we caught just one session. New Song had two sessions with them uh, Friday night over at Section 5, but they concluded, they conclu and they concluded it with a bang. I mean, it was fantastic, fantastic. So much so that we are deciding to uh, bring them back and do it as a joint venture between New Song and Serpent of Christ Church, and we'll have them back. And, and, and if we can get other churches to join in, then we'll rent the auditorium upstairs and bring them in so that, I mean, this is a beautiful married couple, Mike and Donna Lean, um, uh, invited dear friends of Pastor Mike and Cindy Talone, and they did a marriage um, conference on investing in your marriage, and it was excellent, excellent. I mean, even if you weren't married or even thinking of marriage, just the the kind of ministry that came forth from there, from them, was so awesome. So it was great to see Jillian, and we had a good time. And Mercedes Soto is on, and Bilma Cosar is on. Hi, Bilma. Hola, Mercedes. And Valerie Friday is on. Amen. God bless you. And uh, let's see. Um, yes, thank you for the words of condolences. And let's see who else is on. Obviously, Mitch is on. He's helping us out. And uh, and uh, and let's see. Sonia Rodriguez is on. Bendiciones, Sonia. And Olga is on. God bless you, Olga. Good to see you on here. Let's see if I can get you all on the alternate device. Because alternate device will help us better. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Okay, we got it. Myrna's on. Hi, Myrna. And Maribel is on. Look at that. See, I didn't see them on my thing. And Paula is on. Paula, uh, you're having surgery this week. We're praying for you. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you see more on, on, a, on a separate device that, that it doesn't have the switcher. So, um, good morning to all of you. And uh, we just, we were just continue to be blessed uh, by your presence here today. And let's ask the Lord's blessing. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we go into the good and beautiful life. We're finishing up. Uh, not yet, but I hope to finish this, this week. And uh, um, But if I don't finish this week, I'll finish next week. But here's the thing. Um, uh, the week of the second week, right after our anniversary, April 10th is our anniversary, uh, and you're all welcome to come and join us. Uh, Reverend Dr. David Wins, a missionary to the continent of Africa, will be preaching, and he is, he is an awesome preacher. Um, and um, he'll be with us uh, April 10th. And so immediately after April 10th, uh, my wife and I and, and my family will be heading out to Vermont to do the, the college tour uh, for Rosita, who um, is likely to choose Vermont. Uh, she hasn't decided yet, she'll decide, but she's leaning towards that one. So that, that one is far away. And so we'll be staying overnight in the hotel and checking the whole place. And so that week I won't be on. And then when I come back from that, then we'll start the good and the good and beautiful community by James Bryan Smith. So we'll have a little gap in between, and then we'll get started all over again. Uh, the good and beautiful life was fantastic. I I love it, and because it took us through, uh, not exhaustively, but very practically through the Sermon of the Mount, the most important sermon in all of the Bible. It's the sermon on kingdom living. And uh, we are uh, in the kingdom. Christ is in us, and we're in Christ. And uh, we're part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is unshakable, and it's never in trouble, and it's always in victory. So as long as you're living kingdom principles and living in Christ, living in the kingdom, we have our victory secure. And so uh, that's the important part of it, okay? So 
Um, let's get back here, get back here, and let me, yeah, we'll take uh, Mildred Espino. So that's a beautiful picture of her. I'm waiting for Jasmine to send me another picture because we'll be printing out a little program this week for the funeral service. Amen. So let's ask the Lord's blessing. I see that Nelson came on. Hi, Nelson. Always, always good to see you. And we thank God for you. We really do. Amen. And I pray that you are okay and uh, feeling well and strong in the Lord. Amen. Uh, I did say hello to Olga. And of course, we we uh, uh, always say hello to Papa Joe. They're heading to Pennsylvania to see the story of David. Oh, lucky you. I love Sight and Sound Theater. It's a great place for you to take your family. Our kids have seen so many. My favorite one, and, and we saw Esther most recently, the story of Esther, which was great. But my favorite one, the one that made me cry, was the story of Joseph. And, uh, and I saw the whole, the, the gospel, the story of Jesus, and, uh, and several others, you know, they, they do an amazing job. Uh, Broadway, Broadway caliber um, drama and effects, excellently done at the Sight and Sound Theater up there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where the Amish are at, and we always have a good time. And so, blessings to you, Olga. You'll be, you'll be enjoying yourself, and uh, we'll be... Uh, oh, my goodness, you know, just so envious. Oh, I was right, Mitchell says. Mitch says I was right. I wasn't wrong. He was wrong. It is 1848. Okay, 1848 Westchester Avenue. Okay, that's good. It's always good to recognize when you're wrong. <laughs> I, I, I said, oops, I'm wrong. I thank God for Mitch. And then he says, oops, you were right. I, uh, okay. Uber's on, praise the Lord, and we thank God. We heard that on Saturday, uh, Sunday, that uh, Carmelo would be um, uh, taken out of intensive care. That's how I see this brother, Uba's um, husband. His brother has been in intensive care, and uh, we, we, uh, we just thank God for that progress. And Vivian Ortiz is with us, amen. Praise the Lord, Vivian Ortiz. Great to have you, Vivian. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, I think we've mentioned almost everybody that I could see here. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. Lord, we are grieving, but we do not grieve as those without hope. Our sister has won her crown. And now, Lord, we don't pray for her because she's in your presence. And in your presence there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. But we do pray for Yvonne and we do, we do pray for um, Jasmine. And we pray for her two granddaughters. We pray for her brother and her family, all of her family. We pray that you would strengthen them and give them the comfort that only you can give. Uh, she's left a legacy of faithfulness in every church she was a member. She served. She served in such an extraordinary way. And Lord, as we celebrate her, her story, her life, and her legacy on Thursday, may the anointing of your Holy Spirit be there to heal the hearts of those who are painfully missing her, O oh God. We weep with those who weep, and we laugh with those who laugh, and so, Lord, we are joining the Espinosa family uh, in this situation, oh God. And we pray your blessing upon it. And now, Lord, we ask you to just guide us today. Guide us today. And uh, help us to announce the good news of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I got to see Ricardo, our contractor. And the kitchen is halfway done. They're installing the the sink now and they're installing the the they'll be installing i guess the 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 refrigerator and the dishwasher we we are still waiting for the for the stove so that hasn't arrived the stove and the microwave hasn't ro arrived yet but we're hopeful it'll get in soon but it's taking shape they put up they put up the 
the cabinets, and they look beautiful. And what a blessing it is to have them. Amen. Valerie says they're better than Broadway because it's spiritual and Bible-based. You are absolutely right. And they do make all to calls. That's correct. Thank you, Valerie. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Someone says that the sound is going on and off. <clears throat> it's probably on your end. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all God.
let's see if we could do an old song uh, uh, from the recordings anyway. And if it doesn't work, then I'll just go straight into the teaching because we could use some of that. And, and of course, we want to end with prayer. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, amen. Hallelujah. Well, everything's fine here. I see some people saying that they're having the video go in and out. And it, but everything is, is working great here. And it's showing, and I and I have it on a separate device, so it has not gone in and out. It has not gone in and out. So it's it's got to be on your end, and that is not unusual. Was uh, uh, Wi-Fi can be that way. Anyway, Evelyn Leboy is on with us, so we welcome her. That's Francis's mom, and uh, we pray that the surgeries have either completed or or. Uh, or are okay and man and um yeah I, I no everything is good i'm checking everything and i and i have it here and there's no in and out here okay you know i i have it on a separate on a separate device so it's not you know everything can look like it's working here but over here it's sounding perfectly and the video is not going in and out so it has to be your signals and that's an unfortunate part if you live anywhere near building, if your Wi-Fi is near the wall or near uh, anything that's made out of metal, you need to get it away. And sometimes you have to empty the cache because it's loaded with stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm sorry that you're having that. Um, well, I do promise you that that once it's recorded, it'll go on YouTube. So that's just too bad. Those days do come. And uh, we've had plenty of them throughout this <laughs> this time, and uh, you know when you when you depend on uh, cable vision for uh, it, it is tough. Uh, yeah, Uber's updating us that he's still in ICU, but he's talking and eating. She's speaking of Carmelo. Obviously, that's his brother. He's talking and eating, and he has been kept because the doctors want to start a new treatment. Okay, it's all right. So they were about to let him go yesterday, but they decided to keep him because they want to start a new treatment, and that's okay. We want to make sure that he's okay and that he comes through with everything, okay? Um, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, so let's... Um, Let's see if I can get this song on. I don't know if I can get this song on, but let's try, let's try, let's try. Yeah, let's try. Yeah. Ya la barango, yo va todo los reyes. Todo los reyes de la tierra. Porque han oído los dichos de tu boca. Cantarán de los caminos de Jehová. Te alabarán, oh Jehová, todos los reyes, todos los reyes de la tierra. Oído los dichos de tu boca, cantarán de los caminos de Jehová. Porque la gloria de Jehová es grande, porque Jehová es exceso en su camino, porque Jehová atiende al humilde. Mira de lejos al altivo, porque la gloria de Jehová es grande, porque Jehová es excelso en su camino, porque Jehová atiende al humilde, las mira de lejos al altivo, te alabará Jehová oh, todos los reyes, todos los reyes de la tierra, porque han oído de los caminos de Jehová porque la gloria de Jehová es grande porque Jehová es excelso en su camino porque Jehová atiende a los las mira de lejos al altivo porque la gloria de Jehová es grande porque Jehová es excelso en su camino porque Jehová Atiende al humilde, 
mira de lejos al altivo Jesús está pasando por aquí Jesús está pasando por aquí Y cuando Él pasa todo se transforma Se va la tristeza, llega la alegría Y cuando Él pasa todo se transforma Llega la alegría para ti y para mí Jesús está pasando por aquí Jesús está pasando por aquí y cuando Él pasa, todo se transforma, se va la tristeza, llega la alegría. Y cuando Él pasa, todo se transforma, llega la alegría para ti, para mí. Solamente en Cristo, solamente en Él, la salvación se encuentra en Él. No hay otro nombre dado a los hombres, solamente en Cristo. Solamente en Él, solamente en Cristo, solamente en Él, la salvación se encuentra en Él. No hay otro nombre dado a los hombres, solamente en Cristo, solamente en Él. Y no hay Dios tan grande como tú, no lo hay, no lo hay. No lo hay, no lo hay, no hay Dios que pueda hacer las obras como las que haces tú, no hay Dios que pueda hacer las obras como las que haces tú, no es con espada ni con ejércitos, más con su santo espíritu. No es con espada ni con ejércitos, más con su santo espíritu. Y esos montes se moverán, y esos montes se moverán, y esos montes se moverán con su santo espíritu. Una mirada de fe, una mirada de fe es la que puede salvar al pecador Una mirada de fe, una mirada de fe es la que puede salvar al pecador Y si tú vienes a Cristo Jesús, Él te perdonará Porque una mirada de fe puede salvar al pecador y si tú vienes a Cristo Jesús Él te perdonará porque una mirada de fe que puede salvar al pecador conozco a un hombre de poder a un hombre de poder a un hombre de poder Él te ayudará a triunfar, te ayudará a vencer, su nombre es Jesús. Y Él es fuerte más que el viento, su gloria más que el mar. Y nunca termina su amor, en Él puedo yo confiar. Y Él es fuerte más que el viento, y su gloria es más que el mar Y nunca termina su amor En él puedo yo confiar Y conozco a un hombre de poder A un hombre de poder A un hombre de poder Y él te ayudará a triunfar Te ayudará a vencer Su nombre es Jesús él es fuerte más que el viento, su gloria es más que el mar Y nunca termina su amor, en Él puedo yo confiar Y Él es fuerte más que el viento, su gloria es más que el mar Y nunca termina su amor, en Y 
interruptions on your end and uh, nothing that I can do from this side but like I said earlier um, if it's too difficult to listen then you'd have to wait until later on in the afternoon when I post it to YouTube that would be the only option when these days come and we've had them usually it's due to storms but looking through here I see sunlight and no rain and nothing like that. So um, it's, yeah, I see people rebuking the devil. So that's maybe it's the devil. You know, he's the prince of the power of the air. So, you know, <laughs> you never know. Um, but either way, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just, um, we will, we will, uh, let me just set this up here. Here we go. We'll get right into the lesson, and I'll finish it, and then, um, you know, I guess the delays have really caused, uh, you know, the, the program to be uh, way behind from where I am. So I am talking now probably about 10 minutes ahead of what you are able to hear. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, Nelson says that it might be the wind. And that does, it does, um, it does. Absolutely, rain, snowfall, wind does affect it. And, uh, and apparently it's causing uh, problems with choppy and slower speeds. I'm way ahead of you guys based on what I'm seeing you writing. Way ahead, as a matter of fact, we sang a second song already, which you haven't heard. <laughs> And I'm not going to waste more time trying to explain this because I think, uh, you know, this, these are the, 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 the difficulties of, um, you know, signals that go through the air. And uh, as Valerie is interceding there, she's fighting with the prince of the power of the air who doesn't want all of this. But we'll, we'll get it on the air through YouTube on a delayed um, broadcast. It won't be live, but um, you will get a chance to listen to it. Amen. Well, uh, today's lesson, as we continue the kingdom life, what is the good and beautiful life? Uh, I, I just want to, let's see if I could do this. Uh, no, 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 not that one. Not that one. Let's try this. And let's try this. Uh, Let's try this. There we go. And then let's try this. No, we can't go that way. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. No, here we go. And no, that's not it. I want this to be first. And uh, no, 
it's not working. It's not working. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Uh, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Yeah. So let's try this. How is that? The good and beautiful life. We covered this last week, Thursday, and we had these four messages, these four illustrations that Jesus gave on what the kingdom life, um, the kingdom life represented in these illustrations. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount obviously is giving not only the manifesto of the kingdom of God, but he's exhorting everyone who is listening to him that, uh, that, that there are some principles that uh, are to be lived in the present, not just the future. And, um, and, and this is what James Bryan Smith says, when you put all of this together, that is the, the, the good and beautiful life. So the good and beautiful life, um, let's go to Matthew 7, 13 to 14. What I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat what I shared on, on, um, on Thursday and then continue further. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to listen without interruptions. And, um, and hopefully you'll be benefited. You'll benefit from it. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So here we're understanding that Jesus is very clearly saying that the life of discipleship, the life of the saved, the life of the kingdom is not a majority chosen uh, decision um, by humanity. Humanity loves the easy way. Humanity loves that which appeals to the flesh. And humanity loves that which um, they can control. And he calls that the wide way, the wide gate, the gate that is wide. And he says that way is easy. You just follow the the drives of the flesh. You just follow the direction of the world. You just follow the, the God of this world, Satan. And, and, uh, but the problem with that is that it ultimately ends in destruction. When judge the, judgment day comes, those who did not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who did not follow the kingdom life, those who did not become disciples, those would not enter it, and then they would suffer the judgment and destruction. But in verse 14, he says, for the gate is narrow. That's the kingdom life. That, that shows us that it, it's something that you have to kind of push your way through because the gate is narrow. You, you've got to sort of align yourself with God's principles, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it a few. And this, you can combine it with the, with the parable of the sower, where the seed is the word of God. But the, the soil represents the hearts of men. And there are three types of hearts that are not accepted, that they don't permit the seed of God's word to flourish and give fruit. And so here we find that in order to be a true kingdom person, in order to live a true, good, and beautiful life, you must be a fruit-bearing believer, a fruit-bearing apprentice, a fruit-bearing disciple. And, and, and so he says that those who follow the narrow gate and the way that is hard, is it, 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 those will find it. And in the parable of the sower, he talks about that seed that comes and falls into fertile ground, ground that has been broken already, ground that has been plowed already, ground that has been fertilized already, ground that is ready and prepared to receive God's word and allow it to live in there. And he says, those, those are the ones who, who grow and bear fruit. There was even one who did have good soil, but it was surrounded by lots and lots of thorns, 
which he later interprets are the cares of this life, the worries and concerns of this life. When you don't live by faith, you're living by the principles of your emotions and the principle of the world. And that does not allow you to bear fruit. And so the cares of this world choked the plant that started to grow. It got choked and it never produced fruit because it never grew. And that's a sad expectation. So what we have is that 25% of the seed is the one that gives, gives fruit. And here we coincide with Matthew 7, 13 through 14, where it says many, uh, the, the gate that is why, uh, 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 a representative of those many who enter by it, but will meet with destruction. Whereas the narrow gate is a hard uh, life to live, but those who find it will find life and bear fruit, but they are few. So 25% is fewer than 75% when you go to the parable of the sower. So I'm using the parable of the sower to sort of kind of explain the, the, this statement about the narrow gate. And so what we, what we find here, what we find here is, is simply that this thing called the good and beautiful life is something that you have to align yourself with God and follow Jesus all the way. The next passage that he used was Matthew 7, 15 through 20. And now he's talking about false prophets. But he, he's not talking about the kind of false prophets that you and I might be thinking of. You and I might be thinking of false prophets as those who don't believe in the Trinity or those who don't believe in the gospel or those who are uh, saved by works uh, kind of thing. They, they, they focus on the law. And you'll say, you know, those are the false prophets. But Jesus is, no, he's not giving that definition. He's, he's letting you know that they wear sheep's clothing, that they follow, they, they appear to follow the principles of the kingdom, but inwardly they have not changed. So here we see the constant, constant uh, reference by Jesus that it is the inward life that God is looking for. He's looking for a change from the inside out. So it's a life of inside out. It is the godliness on the inside must come out into the outside. It must be manifested in the operations of your life. So he says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So he's saying that they are doing this intentionally to fool you and to get something out of you, get something out of you. And that something usually is money, power, and influence. Money, power, and influence. So you will recognize them by their fruits. In other words, he's gonna, he says, you'll know a false prophet by their fruits. Are they showing kindness? Are they showing love? Are they manifesting patience? Um, and, 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 and humility, those are the things that, that um, represent the true prophets. And he says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And so the answer to rhetorical question is no, they, they, they don't have thorns and the figs don't have thistles, which make it impossible for you or very painful for you to access the fruit because it'll, it'll hurt you. Uh, it, it will prick your, your hand as it's going and cause you to bleed. So that verse 17, he says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree, tree bear good fruit. A tree that's sick with something is going to give sick fruit, a fruit that is not either mature, not sweet, it's not healthy for the palate. It may have worms in it. It's not edible, whatever it is. Verse 19 says, every tree that does not, that does not bear good fruit is cut down. In other words, a tree that doesn't bear good fruit is useless. The only thing it could do is give shade. So you cut it down and you plant another one that is not diseased. Okay, it's good for firewood. That's about it. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, judgment will come for those that are barren in terms of fruit, um, fruit 
uh, development. You have to. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. The old English word is long-suffering, kindness, uh, goodness, um, meekness, and self-control. These Against these, there's no law. So we see that... Um, Jesus is saying, you will know a true prophet, not by the doctrine he preaches, but by how he lives it. It's bearing fruit in his life. He is a loving, she is a loving prophet. She is kind. She's patient. He is joyful. He is meek. He's not prideful. He is under control all the time. He curbs his need for for money power and influence. He, he, he represents the gentleness and the kindness and the humility of Jesus Christ. So those are, uh, are the, uh, uh, the principles of the kingdom is that it's the inner life that, that God is looking for. He's looking for who you are when no one's around. He's looking to see if there's real fruit in your life uh, and, and not and not acting going on, not performances going on. That's why when you get nervous, if you have to speak, uh, uh, th- then you have to just get out of the performance mentality. And that's how I, 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 I overcame the nervousness in preaching and in teaching and in leading because I didn't do it for, to impress people. I did it to honor God. And God honored me in my and my desire to, to, to proclaim the gospel from the inward experience and not just the outward look. I didn't just dress the part, speak the, spot, the part, and carry the part with these two big giant Bibles under my, my armpits. No, um, you could dress the part, you could look like a saint, you could look like a, like a nun or a monk, and uh, that does not make you holy. What makes you holy is the presence of Jesus in your life. He, it, it's from the inside out. Very well. So the third passage that we expounded, and all of these we explained a lot on Thursday. So if this is, if you want to hear more on what this means, you have to go back to Thursdays and listen to it. And, and, and this passage is one of the scariest passages in the Bible. That's exactly how we talked about it. it it's one of the scariest passages. Uh, passages in the in the in the gospel. This is Jesus saying, "Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven." So he's talking about. He's saying, "Hey, just because you have the language of spirituality, you have the talk of religion, does not pass the muster. Why? Because God looks at the inside. He says, "But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he's the one." And so what he's saying is that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than talent. Obedience is better than than numbers. Obedience is better than money. Obedience is better than great temples. Obedience is what demonstrates that God is in you. On that day, which is a reference to the day of judgment, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and this is the scariest part, perhaps the scariest verse in the Bible. He said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And that's the beautiful thing about uh, about this. It's not up to us to perform miracles. It's not up to us to prophesy. It's not up to knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity or you workers of lawlessness. What he's saying is that they were breaking 
the law of God, and the law of God is love. So they were not doing this because they loved the sick, because they loved those who were demon-possessed and they wanted to see them free, because they loved giving a word from God. They did it for admiration's sake. They did it for the applause. They did it for, so that they could be recognized. They did it for the title. They did it for ultimately self-centered reasons. Notice that Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't prophesy. That was a devil prophesy. No, he doesn't even say that they didn't cast out demons. He doesn't even say that they didn't do mighty works in his name. What he said is that's not the criteria for judging whether you are a kingdom person or not. Check that out. So the works, that's why we have not, we should not be so impressed with magn, magn, uh manifestations of miracles, and here I am saying that, knowing that I'm doing a series on miracles and supernatural, and you know, because either extreme is wrong. To deny the supernatural and to deny, and to deny the work of the Spirit is to allow the church to become just a social institution in the world that is in desperate need of the living body of Christ. And, and, and so, so, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is they want so badly everything to be miracles and so on and so forth that they will just build on that even at the, uh, at the cost of knowing who Jesus is. And they did it in the name of Jesus, but Jesus is saying, I never knew you. Get away from me. I never knew you. And what he's basically saying is, I honored the name that you claimed. I honored when you laid hands on the, those that are sick and they got healed. I honored that you said in the name of Jesus, in the power of Jesus, in the representation of the Son of God. When you cast out the demons, you, you said it in the name of Jesus. So the authority of Jesus cast out. Now, those people had faith. Those people who were bound and sick and demon-possessed, they, they came to a place where they trusted Jesus, and God honored the word of these fake disciples and delivered them because God honored his word, not the messenger. And we see in Ezekiel 44 and Ezekiel 45 where God says to the Levites and to the priests who had led the children of Israel into idolatry. He says, because of your calling, you can minister to the people, but you cannot minister to me. What does that mean? It means that there's two ministries that every believer must fulfill. The, 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 the ministry to the lost, the ministry to the sick, the ministry to those who need us. That, that's, that's what we call the horizontal ministry, this direction. We are, we are praying for people here. But then there's another ministry, ministry, and that ministry is vertical. It's upward, where we go into the Holy of Holies, and we worship him for who he is. And God told Ezekiel, tell the Levites who led the children into idolatry, because the gifts are without repentance, they can continue receiving the offerings, cutting the animals, praying and doing everything that is needed so that the people can be forgiven, so that the people can worship with cleanliness. But tell them that they cannot come up to me. I will not receive them because of what they did. So that's a, that between this one and Ezekiel 44 and 45, my God, you have the scariest passages of Scripture because it says that you can... You can actually be used in the gifts of the Spirit and not be saved. You be disqualified. And, and, and that's crazy. And you probably never heard a preacher say that. You probably say, no, Pastor Sam, you went off the deep end. No, this is usually a reference to people who started out right. The Levites started out right. They had a call. The Bible says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. They had a call. They were, with the exception, with the exception, notice this, with the exception of the king of Salem, with the, accept, the exception of the king of Salem, the only priests that God accepted offerings from was Aaron and Aaron's sons. 
But there was a priest before the law that God used in the city of Salem, which later became Jerusalem, and his name, he was a king and a priest, and his name was Melchizedek. And Abraham paid his tithes and worshiped and rendered them to the king of Salem, Melchizedek, because he recognized them as a priest from the order of God. Now, when Moses comes around hundreds of years later, uh, he, he installs Aaron as the high priest. The Levites were the children of Levi. They all had function in the worship. But only the sons of Aaron had the calling and the responsibility to offer the sacrifices in the holies of holies. And if they were not right, they would die upon entering that place. And the people would remain in their sins until a new, a new um, a priest and so they, they took turns all as generations went by. And, and you'll notice that uh, Zechariah, the husband of, um, of Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a priest. And he was offering sacrifices during the time that Mary became pregnant with the, with the child, the son of God. And when, and when God through the angel, appeared to Zechariah and told him that he was going to have a son he was going, that would be John the Baptist, um, he didn't believe it. And in, upon not believing it, God uh, closed his mouth and didn't let him speak until Elizabeth gave birth. When Elizabeth gave birth, he was able to speak because he didn't believe. He, he, because Elizabeth had been sterile. She was barren. She could not have children. So he didn't believe it. So, and here we have the precursor to the gospel, the precursor to the king, the Messiah, John the Baptist in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, which is an Old Testament prophecy that one Elijah would come to prepare the way for the king, prepare the way. And that's what John the Baptist did. And so we see that different, different descendants of Aaron had the right to go into the Holy of Holies. And this is interesting because my brother-in-law, uh, he passed away, and he was from, he, his last name is Taisha. But uh, the Jews know, uh, no matter what their surnames are, uh, which surnames represent which tribe. And he was from the tribe of Levi. Uh, that's why if you see any, any Jewish person with the name Levi or Levine or Cohen, because uh, that's another word for priest, um, they, they, they are from the tribe of Levi. And so they are allowed to read the scriptures in temple because they were Levites. They're the only ones allowed to read the scripture in temple because they're the Levites other than the rabbi himself because he's the teacher of it, even if he's not a Levite. But to read in the service and the liturgy, you have to be a Levite. Well, he was a Levite and he wanted to, to come to service. He wanted me to take him to a Jewish synagogue on a Saturday, I says, good, that's not a problem. I got one right, not, right across the hall from my, my church. And I brought him. And he, we stayed three hours. Their services are three hours long. So, okay, just remember that. Their services are three, are three hours long. Of course, they have, they have liquor right after their services. They have wine and, and a little whiskey and a little scotch and a little this and that. And they all take a sip and then they can say goodbye. But uh, my brother-in-law... You know, he, he, he walked in and I introduced him to, to the rabbi and he told him who he was. And so the rabbi, recognizing that Taisha was a Levi, called him up and he read the scripture for the day. He could read it because he was from the tribe of Levi. The Jews know what tribes they come from. Practicing Jews know what tribes they come from, no matter what their last names are. Because the Jews always carry... Uh, a name from the culture they were in and a Jewish name. And they, they knew their ancestries. This is part of the discipline that a Jewish family does. They repeat the stories of the ancestors and they give the stories of the Bible. And so here we see these two very, 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 and he says, uh, scary passages. He says, he doesn't say to them, you did not. 
You did not prophesy in my name. He doesn't say to them, you did not cast out demons in my name. He doesn't say to them, you didn't do mighty works. You didn't heal the sick in my name. But what did he say? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you workers of lawlessness. So lack of love and lack of intimacy with Jesus. Jesus must know you. You and Jesus must have a relationship that's so tight that he knows your name, he knows where you live, and he's in your life. He's got your back. He is an everyday fixture in your walk and in your talk. So that's why the kingdom life assures us of the good and beautiful life, because we will never be apart from Jesus. All right? So the, 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 the next passage is found in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Again, this is a repeat. If you were listening on Thursday, you heard this, and this is a summary for those who were not on on Thursday and didn't catch up. And, and it says here, and Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house on the rock. So hearing is not enough. Hearing and doing is equal to a man building a house upon a rock, a solid foundation. Why? Because the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Now, this is, this is full of meaning. The rock is Jesus. We find that out in Corinthians, the rock that followed the, the, the Israel in in the um, in the wilderness, the rock of Horeb, La Peña de Horeb, the one that Moses struck when they were thirsty, dying. They struck it and it, it gushed water out, and they drank of it and were refreshed. the The same rock that Moses later on blew it, and he got so angry. The children of Israel, God told them, "This time, don't smite it. This time, speak to it. Speak to it." And it will give rough water. But they were plotting to come against them. And they wanted to kill Moses. And they said, here we are thirsty again. And here you do this to us. And, you know, we want to go back to Egypt and all this stuff. And Moses got so angry that he smote the rock. And, and, and uh, they got water again. But God was very angry with Moses. And disqualified him from entering the promised land. And he died prematurely. He died a healthy man. He did not die of sickness. He did not die of an accident. God took him. Why? Because he ruined the gospel secret. There is in that rock of Horeb a secret of the gospel. When you are in need, you are dying of thirst. Uh, thirst is one of the most primary needs. A man can live without food for weeks on and even months. He'll become sick and he eventually will die. Uh, a man cannot live without oxygen for more than three or four minutes. Uh, oxygen is, you know, that's it. Eventually you start getting dizzy, dizzy, you fall out and you die. But a man cannot live without water for more than two, three, four days. That's it. Why? Because water is a main staple for life sustainment. It is an urgent drive that a man has. And cruising through a desert with hot sun during the day, they couldn't find water. They were dying. And God told Moses while they complained, smite the rock. That Paul says, the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ, Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's the rock. So when Moses smites the rock, it's a picture, it's a type of the crucifixion. In order for Jesus to give life, he must be struck. They struck him as a lamb to slaughter, and he bled and died, and he paid for our sins. So the picture was beautiful. Here, later on, they go on and they become thirsty again. And there's that rock that's following them. There it is. That rock is Jesus. God tells him, don't strike it this time. He doesn't get crucified more than once. It is, it, it's on the cross once and then no more. That's it. So Moses, listen up. And uh, he was to speak to it, which is a symbol of the resurrection. You know, he got struck the first time, he died. But the second time he speaks to him, 
because he rose from the dead. So when he's alive, all you have to do is speak to him. And where is he? He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. So the rock that gave them water in the wilderness is now at the right hand of the Father giving them water in the wilderness again. But this time it was due to the speaking to the live one, the one that had been struck and is now alive. So he ruined the picture of the cross, burial, and resurrection, which is the heart of the gospel. And so for that, God was extremely angry with Moses and told him, you will not enter. I'll let you see it from afar, but you will not enter it. And then God took him. He, he didn't have cancer. He didn't die of old age. The Lord just said, enough is enough. And God took him and God buried him. And nobody knows where he was buried. And the devil wanted his bones so he could make an idol out of him. So people could go worship his bones. You know, I, and you say, well, you know what? How do people were? Hey, Christopher Columbus bones is supposed to be in Santo Domingo in the, in the capital. I, I don't even think those are his bones. But, you know, any tourist attraction will do. The thing is that people... I went there to look because they had a little glass on the top and you could see. They said, those are the bones of Christopher Columbus. Mm, I don't know. I don't know about that. So anyway, but I'm sure, I am sure that the Israelites would have made an idol of Moses because he was the grand liberator. And he was the one who gave birth to a nation. He, he is the most important character in the Old Testament. He really is. I mean, Abraham and Moses are, are neck and neck there. Abraham because he's the father, and Moses because he's the deliverer. Without those two, there's no nation of Israel, and they'll never be free. So here we see that, um, that, uh, that Jesus is saying, hey, if you just hear the words but don't put them into action, you're a hypocrite. And then he says, and rains fall, and floods come, and winds blow, and houses get beat. What is he saying? That in this world you shall have tribulation. Who told you that this Christian life was going to be, uh, you know, um, a skip in the park? Uh, no, it's not a skip in the park. There is opposition. There is a Satan who opposes God's work. There is a devil who is diabolical and evil, and he wants to... Uh, steal, kill, and destroy. And so the Christian life will have storms. The Christian life will have storms. But here's what he says. The house won't fall if it's built on the rock. And that rock is Jesus. And verse 26, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. To hear the word of God, to go to seminary and get an A, to have a degree, a doctorate in theology, but never really flesh it out and live it is, is a phenomenal fool. That's all it is. It's a brilliant fool. But and, and then he goes on, he says, and the and the rains, uh, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be, will and does not do them will be like the foolish man. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And great, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So the one who built his house on the rock, when, it, when, the, when the storms came, did not fall. But the one who hears the word but doesn't put it into practice, when the winds come, and the storm comes, and the waters fall, and the wind blows, the houses fall apart. Great is the fall of it. So we do not have the option of just hearing Sunday sermons without putting them into action. That's why we make altar calls. That's why we call people into a commitment with the Lord. Okay, now um, I want to share with you, and let's see if I can move this. Okay, let, 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 me, let me just go here, and let's see if we can move. Yeah, I'm going to move my face all right. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to get out of here. There we go. I'm just going to get out of here. Yeah, let's, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's, here we go. And let's go here. I'm just going to put the slide. You don't need to see my face. By the way, I haven't checked anything here. Uh, 
Pastor, you are teaching. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so you're hearing me. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. Maybe it's just the music that was causing. I don't know. Anyway, you're hearing me. So here, here what I want you to understand is very, very, very clear. Very, very clear. And that is that kingdom living does not give you the option of being saved but not a disciple. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus said, go and make disciples. He didn't say go and make decisions, makers. He said, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. To observe means to follow, to put it into action. So our salvation is, and our sanctification is progressive. So in the beginning, we may not be observing it as we should, but we should be growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And, and, and we may not be perfect, but we're not what we used to be. And every day we should be applying the word of God in our life. How can that be if you don't read the word every day? If you don't pray every day, that's the oxygen of the kingdom. We talked about it. Oxygen of the kingdom. So not, if we can't live more than five minutes without oxygen, we would die. Um, then what makes you think that you can live without you can live five minutes of the Christian life without prayer. Prayer is the oxygen of the kingdom. Prayer is the oxygen of the kingdom. Uh, the word is the water of the kingdom with the washing of the word. The word. You know, if you don't get into the word every day, if you're not nourishing yourself with the word of God. So what we're looking for is not just disciplines, but the disciplines are necessary because they build habits. If you have don't have a habit of praying immediately when you wake up, it's very hard to develop a this devotional life. Why is this very important? Because the kingdom life is only possible to those whom Jesus knows. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness or iniquity, for I have never known you. So the, the, the security that is eternal, the true eternal security is that Jesus knows you to be his disciple. He must recognize you to be his disciple, not just his decision maker. If you made a decision for the Lord at a Billy Grand Crusade, but you never followed him, you never, 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 never obeyed a single word that he taught you, you abandoned that decision to just the cares of this world, you, my friend, I don't know where you're going to end up. You have no security from, from anything that I will say because I, 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 I'm not sending you to hell. I'm, that's above my pay grade. I don't know. But I know this one thing, that if Jesus doesn't know you, you're not getting anywhere. Depart from me for you I never knew you. I never knew you. So intimacy with Jesus, not a perfect, perfect living where you never lie, where you never this and that. No, those things have to be worked on. And we, we went through it through this good and beautiful life. We put on Christ and we stopped lying. We put on Christ and we stopped gossiping. We put on Christ and we stopped judging others. We put on Christ and we spend time alone with God. We put on Christ and we fast. We put on Christ and we study the word. We put on Christ and we memorize scripture. We put on Christ and we recite the Lord's prayer every day. We put on Christ, we, we recite the Shema every day. We put on Christ and we recite the Jesus Creed every day. Why? Because in those disciplines, you you develop habits, and in those habits, you develop relationship. If you have the habit of walking out on your wife and going with prostitutes every week, you'll come home to a woman that you don't know, and that woman doesn't really know you. So just because you're legally married, because you went to the altar one day, but you're not living the married life, you are giving your heart and your time and your talents to another, and that woman whom you said you were tied to, that woman doesn't know you. And in the end, she'll either find out you were unfaithful or in the end she'll just say hey I don't have a marriage I have somebody who comes home and 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 eats but the rest I don't really know what he's doing that that that's the kind of relationship that many people in the so-called church and even evangelicals, we have a lot of fanatics. We have a lot of people that love the name Jesus. They love the story of Jesus. They love what Jesus did. 
They love it. They repeat it. They know it. They know it. They know it. But when it comes to doing what Jesus says, mm -mm, I don't know nothing. I can't do that. Not yet, Lord. Not yet, Lord. Not yet, Lord. Not yet, Lord. And you don't know when that day comes. If you'll hear, come, my faithful servant, enter into your rest. For in the little you were faithful, and I will give you much. Ah, the other side got, depart from me, you workers of iniquity and lawlessness. I never knew you. So knowing Jesus and having an intimate relationship with Jesus requires the disciplines of talking to him every day. Talking to him every day. My wife has to talk to me every day. And, and even if it's just small talk, maybe it's nonsense talk, but she has to talk to me every day. When I go away on trips and I'm preaching, I'm traveling, or I have something to do, there comes a text. There comes the call. Why? Because we are intimate. We are intimate. We are intimate. She knows me. I know her, who's my wife. I know her. Who's her husband? She knows him. Okay? And that's the same with Jesus. We have to be known by him. You know how I know that Jesus knows me? Because he keeps speaking to me. People who have intimate relationship have open communication. People who have an intimate relationship have open communication. They could talk anytime, anywhere, anyhow. There isn't any place that they cannot talk. They'll find a way and they'll make a way to communicate. If it's just with the eyes or a little note or a text or, you know, mouthing it. Oh, what's going on? I see something that's going on. You know each other. You know what the eyes are saying. You know what the smile is saying. You know what the frown is saying. Because you know each other. You spent 20, 30 years married. You can complete each other's sentences. <laughs> So intimacy with Jesus is the most important thing you could ever have to do. It's the most important thing because without Jesus, we have no salvation. He is our Savior. He is the lover of our souls. He is the most important person that you should converse with every day. And you know, the, the, great, the great prophets of old, they prayed. They constantly were going away to pray. Look at Moses. In the Torah, when you read the Bible every year and you go to the Torah, you see Moses going into the tent, going into the tent, spending a whole day in there, coming out with the glory of God upon him, coming out with the power of God all over him. Uh, uh, when he came out, guess what? When he came out, Joshua stayed. When he, when he, was, he went into the tent of prayer, the tabernacle, and he stayed in there praying, and God spoke to him and to tell the people this. He would go out to call the people, but Joshua stayed in the tent praying for his master, his servant. It's no wonder that when Moses was disqualified and taken by God, that God chose the man who followed him into prayer as his successor. He was a warrior extraordinaire, but he was not known for, for the wisdom that Moses had. But, but the Lord told them, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. So that everywhere you, the plant, the sole of your foot should stand, I will give you that land. Fear not. Fear not. Yeah? I, I, meditate upon this word day and night. Day and night. And I will be with you wheresoever you go. Wow. He did not have the, the background knowledge of, uh, uh, of a prince of Egypt. But he learned the most important thing was prayer. And so we cannot overemphasize the discipline of prayer. But prayer can be a boring for some people. Prayer can be tedious for people. Uh, people who don't rest well fall asleep praying. Um, people who have um, really, um, you know, their circuitry is very electrical. They have trouble concentrating. And if you don't develop the discipline of maintaining communication with God, you won't grow spiritually. Your level of growth and power and anointing depends on the time that you spend alone with God. 
Okay, so today I'll finish up with with a a, a classic book. It's um, gosh, it is called the um, Experiencing the Depths of Jesus by Madame Jean Guyon, a French Christian woman who was persecuted and went through a lot of changes. She wrote this advice to her daughter, and it's two pages in the book, and it is worth it. It is worth it. Hallelujah. And Gloria asked, did you say you could prophesy and not be saved? Yes. Yes, I did say it. <laughs> I'll give you an example of someone who prophesied and wasn't saved. Caiaphas. One must die to save the nation. And John, when he writes it, says, this, he, he didn't realize that he was prophesying, but it, that's what Jesus did. He had to die to save the nation. Uh, Balaam, you know that. Um, and there were many false prophets. What, I'm, what, I mean is, what I mean to tell you this is that when Jesus said to them, depart from me, for I never knew you, he does not deny that they prophesied. He does not deny that he exercised that they exercise demons. He does not deny that they did mighty works. Gotta remember that many, many people were following Jesus and they were imitating him. If you recall, the sons of thunder told Jesus, call the, those, those guys over there, they're imitating you and they're following you, but they're not with us. Uh, you know, give us the power to call down thunder. You know, that's why they're called the sons of thunder. And, and Jesus said, hey, leave them alone. There are people outside of this flock that are mine. Jesus had more than one flock. You didn't know that, huh? Yeah, he did. Nicodemus is part of another flock. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea is part of another flock. There were scribes who received the gospel. They were part of another flock. They weren't part of the flock that followed Jesus. But they had believed in him. And, uh, and in the hour of, of, uh, of um, when, it, when it counted, all the disciples ran, but Joseph and, and uh, Nicodemus said, hey, we got to take charge. We have to get his body and get it buried. Yeah, it's not something that I would normally say, so I know it's controversial, but you see it in, in Matthew 7, where Jesus did not say, no, th those prophecies were false. He doesn't say uh, this, th that those, those demons did not get cast out. He says, I don't know you. The qualifications are not the supernatural works. And we know this also because the false prophet does miracles. Um, and um, the, 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 the Antichrist and, uh, and the false prophet are endowed with supernatural power. Satan has supernatural power. He's an angelic being. He has supernatural power. And he can um, gift someone with prophecy and be accurate. You, you've seen, it's rare, but you've seen people who are spiritists and nail it on the head. One spiritist nailed it on the head. They came to my, my parents' house. There were two families living there. And the two women, my, my uncle's wife and my mother, were both pregnant. And this Santera came to the house and said, there's, there's, one, there's one lady here who's pregnant and she's going to have twins. And, um, and she said it to my, my uncle's wife, Bilal. And Bilal got scared. No, no, no way. I can't have twins. It was my mother. My mother had twins. My brother Mike and my brother Johnny. My brother Johnny and my brother Mike. They were born of twins. It was prophesied by Santera. They have ability to access information in a supernatural way. Obviously, the devil is empowering them. Why, why do we? Why does Jesus say? Why does Jesus not say your prophecies are wrong, or you lied, uh, uh, or those demons were not exercised, or or there were no mighty works? He's saying. That's not the criteria for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom, the criteria for the kingdom of heaven is not how many people you raise from the dead, how many demons you cast out. The criteria 
for the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom life is do you know Jesus and does Jesus know you? Interesting, right? Okay. All right. So I said something controversial. <laughs> okay, Gloria. I hope that helps you, Gloria. And, and you can disagree. That's okay. I'm not a perfect in all my things. Okay? So you can disagree. But I, I find it very, very curious that, um, you know, Simon, uh, the sorcerer, he wanted to buy the baptism of the Holy Spirit gift. He was used to operating in that. The young lady who, who was a sorceress, uh, she was prophesying that Paul was a man of God. She was prophesying, he's a man of God. Listen to him. Listen to him. Paul shut her up and cast the demon out because she was interrupting. And, and because she was prophesying that he was a man of God, and, and, and that meant that the people who were there could say, you know, that her practice was valid. Her practice was not valid. They used her her ability to prognosticate and to predict, they used it to get money. And so when Paul cast the demon out of her, she can no longer practice that. They wanted to kill Paul. They kicked him out because he ruined their business. <laughs> so we see that supernatural prophecies, healings, miracles happen in the underworld. And if they don't happen in the underworld, then we got a lot of explaining to do. But they do happen in the underworld. That's why so many people are caught up. You know why Santeros don't leave? Eventually, they realize that, that some of the stuff they're doing is evil. But they're afraid to leave because they are taught that if they should leave, it's like a, a covenant. They break it, they will die. And I had a hard time getting people who were into witchcraft to who but knew that Jesus was the answer, but they were so afraid to abandon because they had it had been inculcated into the depth of their minds that if they should break with that, they would be cursed and die. They were afraid. And that's the lie of the devil. That's the lie of the devil. So anyway, um, I, I hope that, I, uh, okay, so she says she understands because the Santero prophesied to me that I needed to get to church that the devil was out to kill me. Yes, it helps. <laughs> See, okay, so you know what I meant. All right, uh, okay. So, you know, it, yeah, God can use the devil. And he always used the devil. There's no, you know, the devil's just, just a puppet in God's hands. Of course he could use the devil. Um, sometimes he uses the devil, he lowers the hedge to test us, and and uh, and, uh, and that's a reality. So, so let's get into this, because this is very important. And if I don't finish this today, I'll... Finish this tomorrow, and we have time. A mother's advice to her daughter. Her daughter was having difficulty developing a, a consistent devotional life, and so Madame Guyon gave her some instruction on how to set a day to just completely have devotions with the Lord. And this is what it is. So number one, or rather, how to pass the day devotionally. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Take a look at those, these notes because at the end, you'll have to practice this. This will be the last exercise of, um, of our class on the good and beautiful life. And give me a chance to just drink a little water. My mouth is dry. Okay, yeah. How to pass the day devotionally. All right, how to pass the day devotionally. Here we go. Number one, go to bed at a reasonable hour. You cannot have solid devotions if you don't prepare beforehand. Anything that's done haphazardly may come out haphazardly. So you go to bed at a reasonable hour. This has always been very difficult for me. I am practicing it. Um, I haven't been able to, to follow it every day, but I try to follow it as often as I can. He says, where there is no set time, you cannot establish a pattern. So if you don't start a pattern, you won't build a habit. And when you, once you have a habit, the habit does not make you godly, but it helps you encounter God because you're going to go to God every day. So don't confuse the discipline for the grace. In order not to sleep in too late in the morning, be sure you stay up no later than 10 p.m. She wrote this in the, in the 1600s early 1700s. Um, most people went to bed much earlier than that, much earlier than that, because people, you know, it's scientifically proven that people need 
a minimum of eight hours sleep. Eight to ten hours is healthy sleep, um, especially for people who are active. Um, in order not to sleep in late, you know, they would go to bed at a little bit after sundown. They had lamps, no electricity. They had lamps, gas lamps or, 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 um, or you know, whatever, um, candles. Uh, and, 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 and they wouldn't waste them. So if, if, if the sun went down in the winter around 6 o'clock in the evening, then they probably went to bed around 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And they got up with the chickens. They got up at 4 o'clock in the morning getting ready to milk the cow and do all that stuff. So that was the, the time. So she's saying don't go to bed any later than 10 p.m. And that's still the case because if we have to get up at 6 to make it into work by 8 o'clock in the morning because we have a two-hour commute, whatever, then, you know, you it's very hard because you got to get dressed, you got to shower, you got to brush your teeth, you got to comb your hair, and then you have to, you know, hopefully you get a cup of coffee and a small breakfast or, or you eat breakfast on the job, whatever. The thing is that um, you don't have time to pray. You don't have time to have devotions. You're doing it on the run. So she said to her daughter, try to not stay up any later than 10 p.m. And so when, if, if she got up at, at 5, so it's 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So he, here's seven hours getting up at 5 if you go to bed at 10. So she really was telling her, listen, go to bed at 9. Go to bed at 8.30. That's the time you should go to bed, right? So uh, number two, as soon as you awake, as soon as you awake, present your first thoughts to the Lord. Let God be the first person you talk to. Not your husband, not your wife, not your children, not yourself. Let God be the, the first in your thoughts. Offer him the first fruits of the day, then, and that is your praise. Worship the Lord. You get up, thank you, Lord. Thanksgiving and praise. As soon as you arise, remember to fall on your knees. Now, some of us have bad knees, so you know, it may, it's good to change your position. You shouldn't be, you know, staying in bed because you'll fall asleep right away. So you get up and go to a chair. If you have, like I do, I have a lazy boy next to the bed. So I get up from bed and I go to the lazy boy. And, uh, and I, use, I use my phone to read the Bible, which is nice because the light, I can keep it away from Esther's face because she needs, she needs eight hours of sleep. She really does. As soon as you arise, remember to fall on your knees before God in an act of honor due to his supreme majesty. Worship is first. Worship is first. Before you ask anything, before you read anything, before anything, worship is first. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first thing you do, the highest form of prayer is worship. The highest form of prayer is worship. Okay, number three, after you're dressed for the day, that means you got up, you were showered, you dressed, if you, all you have is a cup of coffee, you, you automatically have one of those that automatically has it, whatever, and spend half an hour in devotion. Half an hour in devotion. In that quiet time, reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made of himself to the Eternal Father. Think on these things. This is what I do when I'm hospitalized. When I'm hospitalized and I'm in pain and I got all kinds of, you know, I, I've been operated multiple, multiple, multiple times for kidney stones. I can't even remember how many times. No less than 10 times have I been in the hospital for kidney stones. No less, probably more. And, um, and some of the situations were complicated. Where I had to stay in the hospital two or three days, even post the operation, because the, they were so big that they broke up and they had to be broken up again. And so they had to go in. And so they left all kinds of gizmos inside me to get to it. Oh, my friends, you don't want to go through what I went through. Okay? And so, but I learned, and I, I learned this from Johnny Erickson. You know, she was in a lot of pain because of her paralysis. And people think that people who are paralyzed don't feel anything. No, they're in constant pain. Constant pain. And, and so she was, and, and God ministered to her and says, I'm giving you the opportunity to understand what my son went through on the cross. Hanging in there. Yeah, and I and I learned from her, and and it helped me, because they they wanted the anesthesia to be out of my system before they would give me a painkiller. Wow, 
And that anesthesia was great, but it was no longer covering for the pain. It just made me loopy, 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 loopy. Oh, I'm in pain. Give me something. And Mr. Cologne, calm down. We, we'll give it to you when we get you out of recovery and into your room. There will be a pain medication waiting for you there. I was all, hurry up. <laughs> it's rough, man. But here we go. Here we are. He says, in that quiet time, reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made of himself and to the eternal Father. And offer yourself to him. Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. This is your reasonable worship. Your re this is the minimum of worship, is to offer your body a living sacrifice. That he may do with you and in you what he pleases. The other day I posted on the stories on Facebook, uh, John Wesley's covenant prayer. Uh, I, that's another one that I'm going to ask you to memorize. Memorize John Wesley's covenant prayer, one of the most powerful prayers and it's a total surrender prayer it's a total surrender it's a submission prayer and that's one that we should pray to jesus every day and maybe we won't be so easily persuaded not to obey him if you pray that every day and he says uh that he may do with you and in you what he pleases let your principal exercise be absolute submission to the whole will of god remember to serve him is to reign. I love that. And I, I put that those words in italics. Remember, to serve him is to reign. The kingdom life is reigning with Christ. And part of reigning with Christ is to serve him. And to serve him is to reign. Amen. Praise God. Number four, never pass the morning without reading some spiritual book such as Thomas Akempis. This is her recommendation. It's mine, too. I started reading this book in 1975, and I always have it nearby. I have, I have it on my desk. Uh, the great thing about it is that there, there's short little paragraphs. It's not a book that you read. like no, no, There's short statements um, basically about surrendering, humility, and don't think of yourself too highly. Uh, it's a great book to cultivate humility. And it's called The Imitation of Christ. Do not read too much. You don't have to because one paragraph is so heavy. But what you do read, read with relish and aim towards application. In other words, Lord, help me to apply this today. And read it slowly. Read the same sentence over and over again. Some, some of the paragraphs are only two or three sentences long. But read them over and over and over again until you start seeing yourself living it in your mind's eye. Number four, uh, did, did, I, did I pass number four? Yeah. Number three, number four. Never pass the morning without reading some spiritual books such as Thomas. Oh, I had, that, that was number four. Okay, I, I, I got confused there. Number five, when you come from this time of devotion, be careful not to let your spiritual thoughts fade away. But preserve what you have received as a precious gift you do not want to neglect. This is where I would add journal. Put the date, Thomas Akempis, page 36, the line that says, uh, you're not all that. So give all the glory to Jesus. You know, something like that, right? And let that, let that rummage, you know, let, 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 it, let it chew on the cud. That's what it is. Chew on the cud. Uh, they said meditation is like uh, the chewing of the cud by a cow. A cow swallows its food, chews it, chews it, swallows it, regurgitates it back, chews it some more, swallows it, regurgitates it back, chews it some more, because in each process, in each process, it's breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking it down. And these cows grow to be humongous, and all they eat is grass and hay. So it's, it's the way they break down that grass and that hay. They break it down to the point that it gives them the full nutrition. All right, the fire kindled in prayer soon goes out if it's not kept up the rest of the day. Remember the illustration. Uh, our devotion should be on fire, and fire can only remain if you nourish it, if you keep adding and keep moving it and keep blowing air on it and making sure. Yeah, if you don't tend the fire, the, tend, the fire will fall out, will go out. 
And so the fuel you must feed it with is frequent recollection of what God told you. And through prayers of love, apply it, what God told you. And then thanksgiving, thank the Lord. And then offering yourself to God, here I am, tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing, O Lord. As you go through the day, turn your mind inwardly. For there you will find God who is at the center of your soul. Turn your mind inwardly to that place where God spoke to you. And in his words, you're going to find his presence in your soul. Think of God throughout the day. Think of him. Don't let it go out of your mind. Number six, in addition to times when you pause for prayer, whenever you have free time, you must read the Holy Scripture. You should also be reading it, you know, in an organized way, in a chronological way. If you're reading the Gospel of John, then read chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 that day. Then tomorrow you pick it up at chapter 4. And it could be that you'll only spend time on chapter 4 instead of reading three chapters. But you read it. You read it and you read it for understanding. Make it your principal study. Let it be your daily bread. You will learn there from Christ himself what you are called to do and how not to offend him. Therefore, my dear child, I advise you not to pass one day without reading at least a portion of the Bible. I can't go a day without reading a portion of the Bible. I've made that my aim for many years. And, and I do. I do. And when I, I, I go a day without reading, I feel like I messed up bad. And now with, with devices, man, I don't go through that anymore. Because I'm constant. I, I go in the car and I'm listening to the Word of God. I was listening as I'm coming down. And by the way, now that, that reminds me. As I'm coming down, I put the Audible on. And you can put the Bible Audible on and you can put books that you buy. We have a, a, a family from South Carolina, the Hodges. You... you you see them, they come on a lot. They're willing to pay a one-year subscription for someone who, who would love to have um, Audible, which is an app that you have to pay a, a monthly or a yearly thing. And, and if it's not within your budget, you got to get in touch with me, and I'll get you in touch with them. They have committed to paying for one person's Audible subscription for one year. What that does is... If you're too tired to, to read uh, or you do long drives, you, you put it on the speaker in the car and you listen to it. I, I've read about 10 books. Uh, through I ha Not read it, I've heard it read to me. About 10 books. Books that I don't really use to study, but books that I want to get information from or listen to or be entertained by. Um, uh, okay, so uh, just... Text me or send me a message, and I'll connect you to the Hodges. And, and we thank the Hodges family, uh, June uh, and Tanya Hodges and Gideon Hodges for offering that. That's a very kind and generous uh, thing to do. So um, the first one who reaches out to me and says, hey, I, I could use it. I don't really have the money to, to do that. It, it, it's by subscription, and then you can subscribe for a whole year. You can subscribe, I think, for a month. I subscribe for the whole year because I download books like crazy. And, and I read them. Sometimes I don't read the whole of them. I read only portions. There, there are books that I... But it, it, it's, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. So here we go. Let's get back to Madame Guyon. <laughs> she said, read it off and make it your principal study. Let it be your daily bread. Daily bread. Daily bread. You eat every day. You have to read the Bible every day. And how not to offend him. You know, you will learn uh, You will learn there from Christ himself what you are called to do and how not to offend him. Therefore, my dear child, I advise you not to pass one day without reading. Uh, not to pass uh, one day without reading at least a portion of the Bible. Sometimes you may read where the book opens. Uh, we call that Bible bingo. But let your general method be to read it in order, beginning where you left off last, that you may better understand its beauty and relish with its sweetness. And that's what we're a, a long, large group of us. Um, Mitch, Mitch um, Weber uh, is a blessing. Uh, just around New Year's, he challenges a whole bunch of people to join him in reading this, reading that. And in the last three years, we've read the Bible together with him. 
uh, from, from Genesis to Revelation, and I'm doing it this year. I told him that next year I'm going to try it different because I, I'm so hyper that I like to try different methods, so uh, not to feel bad if I don't join him, but I, I read the Bible every year, and I've read the Bible over and over and over and over. That's why I'm able to pull out illustrations from different parts of the Bible because those stories are in there from Sunday school and from reading the Bible every year. Uh, read with humility and read, um, read with an open and searching mind in order to edify and nourish your soul. Pray before you read. Ask the Lord to speak to you through the word. And you can also pray scripture. I pray, I pray a lot of the Proverbs. I pray a lot. The Psalms, you got to be selective because sometimes he's telling, you know, he's asking God to kill some people. And that's just not my, my thing. If I get stuck going that way, oh my God, Ukraine and Russia, oh Lord. Read with humility. Pray before you read. Ask God to speak to you. Ask yourself as you reflect, based on this passage of the Bible, what is God calling me to do today? Apply it. Apply it. That's what Jesus means, to, to hear it and do it. Apply it. And then number seven, Number seven, you may pass the rest of the day at work or visiting your friends, but have this goal in mind. Never spend an entire day without reserving some part of it for recollection and prayer. Recollection of what God spoke to you, what you committed to memory, what you, you heard God speak into your life, and prayer. Never allow a day to go without that. And lastly, number eight, as you prepare for sleep, try to examine yourself particularly your thoughts and words and actions of the previous day. Do this with a contrite heart and make a resolution to improve tomorrow and ask God for his assistance. Yeah, you're going to find out that maybe you told a little fib. All of us do. It's just part of life. You know, you're trying to stay away from arguments. You, you, you want to get out of a, 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 a foolish situation. So you say, no, I got to go. I got to go. I, I do that all the time. I got to go. And it's not a lie because I got to go because I can't, I can't be listening to you anymore. You're, you're driving me nuts. You're, you're causing me to sin. So I, I, I got to go. I got to go. It's literally the truth. But, um, uh, you know, if the Holy Spirit convicts you, then what you want is every day before you go to sleep, hey, Lord, how can I do better tomorrow? How can I avoid having to lie? How can I avoid having to say this to this person and so on and so forth? And uh, this will make you rest well and rise again in that same disposition of humility and adoration. If you go to bed humble, you'll wake up humble. If you go to bed worshiping the Lord, you'll wake up worshiping the Lord. If you go to bed with surrender on your heart, then surrender, you'll wake up with surrender and do the same thing the next day. Do the same thing the next day. Okay, my friends, um, th this is, um, yeah, Nelson says he, he needs extra sleep this week. This Saturday will make two years. It's been two years since our beloved Merlene passed away. And, uh, and he knows himself, so his emotions will stir strong that day. May the Lord be with you this Saturday. Make it a devotional day, Nelson. Make it a devotional day. Amen. Yeah. Make it a devotional day. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We want to pray for the family of Mildred Espinosa. Remember that a funeral will be on Thursday, Thursday afternoon around 1.30. Body will be ready at Thomas Montero, 1868 Westchester Avenue. And uh, the service will be around 6, 6.30. Amen. And uh, we continue praying for Ana Reyes, for her heart. Uh, also, the family of Naomi Del Valle. Her father, Ruben Gonzalez, passed away. So let's pray for Naomi Del Valle and, uh, and her family. 
Uh, Pastor Jean's sister, Lydia, has a blood disorder, and they're going to do some infusions this, this week. We pray that she will do better and improve. This Saturday, I forgot to announce, is the Women's Fellowship. Don't forget to register. You have to register. You have to register. You have to register. Don't, don't blow it. They need you to register so they know how much food they have to get. All right. Um, also, Faith Outreach will be on April 9th. So get in touch with Judy Weber, uh, Gary Buon, or Elder J, or um, Mitch, Mitch Weber. Amen. Paula Garidi, she's having um, surgery in her eye. Yeah. My brother, Jorge David, he's not doing well, uh, although he's improving. His oxygen levels, they go up and down. When he gets agitated, they go really down. And when he's calm, they go all the way up. And um, just trusting God that he, he can recover. He's 84 years old and in the hospital. Um, we submitted our proposal for uh, River Bay on uh, Monday, yesterday, and we continue to pray that God will give us favor, that they will give us that, that site over there for nothing. That's what I'm asking, you know, for nothing. Nothing but the commitment to serve this community with better services. For Cookie Quinones, who is um, in using a clinical trial drug to treat her leukemia. Angel Ponce is recovering from heart surgery. They put a defibrillator, defibrillator in his heart that will keep him alive. Carmelo Rodriguez is, um, I see this as brother. He's still in ICU, but he's doing much better. And uh, they're gonna be giving him some special treatment. These are many more, obviously, for our brother Nelson, who, ah, uh, man, yeah, his wife passed away on, uh, I guess it was April, in the beginning of April last year, amen. If you have a prayer petition, well, put it in there, and someone will see it, and they'll pray for you, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. People are praying for each other already. This is the beautiful thing about these devotionals. We get to pray for one another. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all of your love toward us. And Lord, we just want to know you like we've never known you before. And we want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your love. And I pray, O oh God, for the Espinosa family, Jasmine and Yvonne, her daughters, her grandchildren, and, um, and all of her family, O oh God, as we say farewell until we meet again to our beloved sister Mildred Espinosa. Supernatural strength to each and every one of the family. Save those that have not made a decision for you. Let the anointing flow, O oh God. Lord, we pray for Anna Reyes that you heal her heart, O oh God. Lord, this, this valve that's not working correctly, Lord, you can make it heal, O oh God. And we just pray, O oh God, that she would just progress and get better. And Father, we pray, O oh Lord, for Lydia. Lord, we pray for... Oh, God, the family, the Diaz family, Lydia and Paula, who have surgery. Lord, and, and, and her husband, oh, God, Frank, for his aunts, oh, God, the elderly, and he looks out for them, Lord. And we pray, oh, God, for those who have cancer and those who have COVID and those who have heart conditions. We pray for Angel Ponce that he will have a quick and full recovery from all of these operations that he's had, oh, God. And Lord, we pray, oh God, for my brother, Jorge David, Lord. He needs you, oh God. Lord, his oxygen levels rise to a healthy level when he's calm. So Lord, we pray you just calm him, Lord. We know that he suffers from a condition and he doesn't always know where he's at. And Lord, 84 years of age, he's, he's been serving you for 
the last 20 or 30 years and you have made him a prayer warrior, Lord, let him benefit from those years of prayer, oh God. And let his his lungs be healed, his any infection that's running through his body. Cancel it in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. I pray for the proposal that we submitted yesterday. I thank you, Lord, for Elder Nancy and Jeannie Ramos and Elder Jay Ramos and Pastor Louis Ramos as they gathered this weekend to put together and write this proposal, Lord. We, we're asking you to answer it in the affirmative so that we can begin to just create ministries for people to minister to people in this community, oh Lord, I pray. And Lord, we pray, oh God, for Kuki Quinones, we pray for Angel Ponce, we pray for Carmelo Rodriguez, that he will be able to get out of um, intensive care and breathe well. Thank you, Lord, for the, the blessing of seeing his improvement. Now, Lord, let him be sent home free and able to breathe and, and to thank you for healing him. And Lord, we present the unspoken petitions the ones that I have not read, but you see them. You are so knowledgeable. There's nothing hidden from you. And Lord, you see the needs and you feel the needs. And so we ask you, O oh God, to just speak a word of healing to them. And Lord, we thank you for all of these things. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Okay, my friends, I have an appointment in three minutes. So I got to get out of here. <laughs> I have to break down. Thank you for joining us today, and I pray that this will have been a blessing to you. Sorry for the, whatever was causing the skipping. Um, Valerie prayed that skip away, and, and so praise the Lord for that. God bless you, and forget about the rest. Jesus is the best. Have a wonderful day.